For Pacifica Radio, January the 26th, 2023, I'm Scott Horton. This is Anti-War Radio. All right, y'all, welcome to the show. It is Anti-War Radio. I'm your host, Scott Horton. I'm the editorial director of Antiwar.com and editor of the new book, Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. You can find my full interview archive, more than 5,800 of them now, going back to 2003, at scotthorton.org and at youtube.com slash scotthortonshow. And you can follow me on Twitter, if you dare, at scotthortonshow. All right, introducing our first guest today, it's Kyle Anzalone. He's opinion editor at antiwar.com. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Kyle? Doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me back on the show. Uh, Really happy to have you here. Hoping we can start off by catching up on the bad news. Top headline on antiwar.com right now. German foreign minister says we are fighting a war against Russia. You don't say, huh? Yeah, bad news, but a big omission here because, you know, those of us who have been covering and talking about the war have known that this is you know, has surpassed the proxy war, uh, particularly over the past couple of weeks with the announcements of, uh, you know, sending main battle tanks to Ukraine, the striker, the Bradley fighting vehicles, and talking about ramping up production of our, uh, you know, ability to produce uh, artillery shells by 500%. And this is going to take a couple of years, Scott, but the plan is to use this for the war. So, uh, you know, we're just getting from the German foreign minister what the rest of us already knew. But it's still a really big deal for such a high ranking official to say this. And I'm sure we're going to see a reaction from the Kremlin. Yeah. Now, General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I think, again, it's fair to say, speaking for the rest of the chiefs, too, said last week or that he doesn't see how the Ukrainians are going to, uh, I believe the quote was, dislodge the Russians from eastern Ukraine. So he said, you know, the way things are going, the war is going to continue going on for years. And that sounded like a warning, something to avoid rather than just, you know, a diagnosis of the situation. But more confirmation, really, that, you know, our military sees this contest as a uh, unmovable force versus immovable object type situation. The Russians can't conquer all of Ukraine. Hell, they can't even conquer all of the East. But nor can the Ukrainians drive them out. So we're supposed to just keep this thing going for another year or two or three somehow? That's what they're talking about in Washington, D.C., huh? Yeah, and and maybe even longer, Scott, because it now seems that the White House is relaxing on the idea of attacking Crimea, and there's new discussions in the White House about helping Ukraine to attack Crimea. And and so, you know, the the ambitions are not getting any more realistic, but actually uh, quite a bit more extreme, especially from the, you know, Washington, Kiev side of this war. And, you know, with how much they're ramping up production. And again, this is going to take years. They're they're sinking billions of dollars in this and it's going to take years. And so they're really anticipating that they're going to need, you know, to be able to send Ukraine 90,000 plus artillery shells every month two years from now. Man. And you know what? If it's just a ripoff and, you know, the uh, military industrial complex has to make their money, that's one thing. They're really planning on this war lasting for another couple of years. I got news for the radio audience here today. We'll all be dead by then. There's no way that this war is going to continue on for years longer without this escalating into a major power conflict between NATO and Russia. Absolutely, Scott. And, you you know, especially how fast the escalations are now coming from the West. You know, this week we had the big announcement of the Abrams tanks, the Challenger tanks, the Leopard tanks, the main fighting tanks from uh, the main European and American, the NATO powers. Uh, but now, you know, we're having renewed conversation about Lockheed Martin uh, from Lockheed Martin and saying they're ready to meet the F-16 demands for the U.S. and its allies so they could ship them to Ukraine. And this is something that I've been talking about a little bit on my show, Conflicts of Interest, over the past couple of weeks, because uh, the, the Pentagon recently was looking at a Boeing plan that would put uh, rocket motors onto small diameter bombs and then and shoot those 
was up high enough that they could use uh, guided systems to hit targets. Well, the Pentagon is saying that that's going to be a redundant technology, and I think that means they're planning on you know just putting those small di diameter bombs on the planes, which is uh, the the typical way those ordinances are delivered to their targets, and so that would make the the rocket motors completely unnecessary, the Boeing plane completely unnecessary. So I I do think that this is on the horizon too. Man, and you know, if it was Raytheon or General Dynamics or anybody else, it'd be a little bit different. But we all know the history here. Uh, Bruce Jackson, the executive vice president of Lockheed, was the founder of the Committee on NATO Expansion. And the whole thing was a racket. The whole thing was about getting rid of airplanes. If the Eastern European nations can't afford them, the American taxpayers can. And so, you know, to get to the point now where Lockheed is saying, hey, we got plenty of F-16s. To go ahead and transfer on for use in Ukraine is uh, no surprise. This is the culmination of Lockheed's, a.k.a. America's foreign policy. Right. And there's been some great articles this week at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft by Eli Clifton and Ben Armbruster. And then we're going to have one at Antiwar.com this weekend by Guy Somerset going over how, you know, these military industrial complex, these weapons makers are funding the think tanks. And those think tanks are then informing our politicians on what they should believe on this war. And so, of course, if Lockheed Martin says, you know, they're ready to sell F-16s, I'm sure that means they've told all these groups that they uh, give give large chats to that, hey, we're ready to sell F-16s and we're going to start to see more articles uh, from people like Kimberly Kagan and Jack Keane telling us, oh, it's a really big deal that we get those F-16s to Ukraine in the coming months. Yeah. Give me just a minute here. At the Libertarian Institute, we publish books, real good ones. So far, we've got Will Griggs' No Quarter, Sheldon Richmond's Coming to Palestine and What Social Animals Owe to Each Other. And four of mine, Fool's Aaron, Enough Already, The Great Ron Paul, and my brand new one, Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And I'm happy to announce that we've just published our managing editor Keith Knight's first one, The Voluntarist Handbook, an excellent collection of essays by the world's greatest libertarian thinkers and writers, including me. Check them all out at libertarianinstitute.org books. And for a limited time, signed copies of Enough Already and Hotter Than the Sun are available at scotthorton.org slash books. Hey guys, I had some wasps in my house. So I shot them to death with my trusty Bug Assault 3.0 model with the improved salt reservoir and bar safety. I don't have a deal with them, but the show does earn a kickback every time you get a Bug Assault or anything else you buy from Amazon.com. By way of the link in the right-hand margin on the front page at scotthorton.org. So keep that in mind. And don't worry about the mess. Your wife will clean it up. And boy, you know, they were talking before about, geez, we would never send in battle tanks. I mean, that would be an escalation. That would make us co-belligerents. Joe Biden whispered loudly into a microphone. That would mean World War III. And now they're going for it. But that's nothing compared to throwing in F-16s. Yeah, this this seems like a, a huge escalation uh, that is going to happen. And we haven't even seen really what Russia is going to their full response to the the sending the tanks in, because, of course, none of them have arrived to Ukraine. Uh, but just in the hours after the announcement, uh, there's been some pretty heavy bombing of Ukraine's infrastructure by Russia, uh, which, which seems to be a response to the, the Western announcement of the tanks going in. Mm. And, you know. The Ukrainians presumably still have thousands of tanks left over from the Soviet Union. And why? Are, I mean, obviously, they're not as high quality, supposedly, as whatever these uh, German leopards are. But they have thousands of them still just sitting in storage. And yet it's the height of importance that they get these Western tanks by the dozens. Do you know what's the supposed trick there? You know, I've seen a lot of speculation around, Scott, that the idea is you want Russia, Russians blowing up Western-made equipment and that those visuals will help to propel the war among the Western audience. Uh -huh. Or not. I mean, I saw Representative Massey say this will be a humiliation when we have footage of our best tanks in, you know, burning husks all over the ground over there in Ukraine. It's going to cost us. Never mind literally costing us our tanks, it's going to essentially be uh, 
revealing of the lack of American power and ability to change the circumstances on the ground there when they do this. So, but again, I guess, fine, just more fodder for the next argument for more escalation. Well, that's why we need F-16s. Hell, that's why we need B-1 bombers. Hell, let's just nuke St. Petersburg. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's the scale that they're on. That's why they call it an escalatory spiral. Yeah. And Scott, there's a, a new report from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists out this week, and they moved the doomsday clock 10 seconds closer to midnight. So it's now at 90 seconds to midnight. That's the closest point in, in the history of the group doing the, the doomsday clock. And uh, a lot of what they contributed to is the war in Ukraine, the refusal of the West to engage in talks. But a lot of the concern in the report is around the fact that there's no one way to uh, uh, unwind this conflict or to de-escalate it. And so, you know, there's no talks going on. Nuclear accords have already been ripped up. It doesn't look like there's going to be talks on extending the new start or replacing the new start treaty anytime soon. And so even if, you, you know, the world gets lucky and we skirt disaster in Ukraine, it's not like there's a way to wind down nuclear tensions between Russia and the West. And, and, you know, we've seen heightened tensions now in Serbia and Kosovo. And of course, we're looking at, you know, bringing more states into NATO. Uh, you know, we reasserted Georgia could come into NATO. We're looking at Finland and Sweden. So there's plenty of potential uh, conflict place, places between Russia and the West in the years to come with no ability for the two sides to de-escalate the situation whatsoever. Yeah, it's really something else. We would need a full-scale regime change here and Probably there for the two governments to be able to sit down and talk again and doesn't look like Putin's going anywhere. It doesn't look like the American national security regime is going anywhere. But, of course, it'd be the right thing to do. All the good liberals remember when Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton announced their reset. They wanted to get along with Russia. Was that treason? Or they were trying to do the right thing, but the neocons undermined them, you know? Well, Hillary herself undermined it all, but. Obama was clearly trying to get along with Putin and got his, you know, worked with him on Syria, worked with him on Iran. And it was the neocons who ruined everything with this coup in 2014. But anyway, listen, it's anti-war radio. I'm talking with Kyle Anzalone here. And to wrap up, can you talk a little bit about this corruption scandal that has rocked Ukraine as the headline reads here? Yeah. So, you know, I have a lot of questions about what's really going on here. If this is a political move by Zelensky to consolidate power, if it's a way for him to try to signal to the West that he's attempting to bring Kiev, Kiev up to the standards of uh, maybe the European Union or NATO, because both of these groups often cite the corruption in Ukraine being too high for uh, Kiev to become official member of those organizations. Uh, but there has been an, a well known for a long time, uh, particularly if you read articles dated before, uh, was it February 24th, 2022, they, they regularly refer to Kiev as being the most corrupt European country or the, you know, most corrupt country in like, you know, the NATO sphere and things like that. And now Zelensky, uh, you know, fired a bunch of deputy ministers and then a, a bunch of heads of different governance. Uh, but a lot of those were in regions that Russia had made gains in and had controlled for a certain period of time. So, again, I, I kind of suspect that this is somewhat something of a power grab on Zelensky's side, probably a little bit of a PR mood, move from the Ukrainian state. There's plenty of corruption to clean up there. So they pick out a few deputy ministers. They call it a high ranking uh, thing And then, you know, now they have a, a better case to join these international organizations, but uh, it's certainly probably going to cause uh, quite a few problems within Ukraine uh, administratively as, you know, they look to get new people in these positions. Yeah, that's the whole thing about all these anti-corruption drives. We saw this in Saudi Arabia, right? Oh, Mohammed bin Salman is launching a massive anti-corruption drive. Well, let's see. Is that because he's against corruption? Or he just wants to arrest his cousin and take his place as crown prince. <laughs> so you see the same Absolutely. kind of thing going on here, obviously. Right. And that doesn't mean the cousin isn't corrupt, right. of course. But Mohammed bin Salman is corrupt as well. And we, we know Zelensky is very corrupt himself. Yeah. Well, listen, we better run. We're all out of time here. But thank you so much for your time and all your great work at antiwar.com, Kyle. Thanks, Scott.
All right, you guys, that is Kyle Anzalone, opinion editor at antiwar.com. All right, y'all, and that's it for Antiwar Radio for today. I'm your host, Scott Horton, editorial director of antiwar.com and editor of the new book, Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Find my full interview archive, more than 5,800 of them now, going back to 2003 at scotthorton.org. And follow me on Twitter, at Scott Horton Show. I'm here every Thursday from 2.30 to 3 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. See you next week.